community organizer for this uh, uh, very nice invitation. I'm very happy to start. So we speak about the spectrum of random graphs. Uh, and uh, broadly speaking, uh, I will try to um, we will uh, look. We will try to to understand some of the subtle connections between uh, the geometry of the graph and uh, its spectrum. Okay, so it will be the spectrum of what? It will be the spectrum of a local operator that you can, which are naturally defined on the uh, on a graph. Okay, so today we will uh, I will do some. Uh, 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 I will introduce some basic notion and the setup tomorrow. Uh, uh, we will study uh, something which we we'll call spectral percolation. So we'll look at uh, how does uh, uh, the spectrum is perturbed by uh, uh, on random instance of graphs, on the, on the spectrum of a random of a random graph behave. And on the last uh, course, uh, I will speak about uh, uh, spectral gaps and outliers and extremal eigenvalues <coughs> of uh, graphs. Okay, but so today. Uh, so what will be the setup? So you have a graph, so you have a set of vertices, V is countable, and uh, you have a set of edges, and uh, which are pairs of uh, vertices. Okay, so our graph will be uh, locally finite. Which means that uh, uh, for any vertex, the degree is finite, where the degree is a sum <coughs> of the is a number of outgoing edges, so is an indicator that over all vertices of the graph that x y is in an edge. Okay. For simplicity of notation, my graph will be simple, but uh, meaning that uh, uh, there will be no loops or multiple edges. So this is a multiple edge, but it x and y. <coughs> And this is a loop. Uh, okay, but you can add them by changing slightly those notations. But okay, so my graph will be locally finite, meaning that the degree is finite for any vertex. Okay. When you have a locally finite graph, you can define the adjacency operator, or all uh, natural and many other local operators associated to your graph. So the adjacency operator. Uh, what is it? So it, you have the L2 space uh, indexed by uh, the vertices of the graph, and you look at uh, the, compact, the finitely supported uh, vector on L2 of E, and uh, you define it like that, but for any function which is compactly supported, uh, A psi estimated at x will be uh, the sum over y i in x, all y which are connected to x. Okay, this will be the notation uh, of psi of y. Okay, and uh, in a matrix type notation, if e x is a is a e x are the canonical um, orthonormal basis of L two of e, you write that. Uh, uh, e x uh, scalar product with a of e y is simply the indicator that uh, x is connected to y. Okay, and uh, and this this is l this is indeed in L two of v because the degree is finite. You can check that uh, very easily. Uh, another. Uh, simple property is that if you look at, so let's call that uh, a of x, y, a k of x, y, okay, is uh, simply the number of, of walks uh, from x to y uh, of lengths K. Okay, so the power of the adjacency operator <coughs> encodes the counting function of works in your graph. 
Okay. Should I define what is a work? So it's a sequence of uh, vertices, and successive vertices are uh, connected by an edge. Sorry, I think you explained it a few minutes ago, but what's the difference between L2B and L2COMPLE? It's uh, finitely supported. Vectors of L2 of V. <coughs> okay, and uh, if my, gra my graph is simple, so if you have a meaning that uh, there is no orientation of the edge, so A is symmetric. Okay, so to look at the spectral properties of, uh, let's say, for example, if V is finite, okay, so it's uh, uh, A is, uh, you know that A will be, uh, will admit a normal basis of eigenvectors, so you will, you will be able to write A as psi k, psi k star. Okay, where well, the psi k are the, eigen, are the orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, and the lambda k are the eigenvalues of A. Okay, and uh, you could write it like that, where E lambda, it's called the, where E is a projection valued measure, which is called the resolution of the identity, is the sum of the psi k, psi k star, direct mass at lambda k. Okay? This is called the resolution of the identity. So it's a, it's a spectral projection, so E, if you estimate it on a, on a set I, it's simply the, you, it's the orthogonal projection on the vector, on the ve on the vector space spanned by the psi k whose eigenvalue is in A. <coughs> okay, so so it's an orthogonal projection of eigenvectors whose eigenvalue is in A. Okay, so I write it in this uh, complicated way. You will see why. Uh, because if, in the general case, okay, uh, use this uh, resolution of the identity still makes sense, uh, provided that your operator A is a self adjoint <coughs> So I will comment on that in so one second. So being symmetric is not enough to uh, to, to be self-adjoint. For example, A should be could be bounded. Maybe I could have written that. That um, if the degree of x is bounded by d for any x in V, the operator norm of A is bounded by d. Okay. As operator norm is so for example if the degree is bounded, uh, your <coughs> operator is a bounded symmetric operator, it is self-adjoint. When your when the degrees are not uniformly bounded, uh, there are examples of graphs which are not essential, which are which does not have self unique self adjoint extension. Essentially, means that there is a unique self adjoint extension. Uh, so, if A is essentially self adjoint, then you can always use uh, you can al also write A uh, will also be uh, unitarily in in unitarily equivalent. Uh, to 
euh, diagonal opérateur. And uh, so it has a domain. So I will not bother you with these notions. If you don't, you are not familiar with them. We don't. We will not use them. But uh, and uh, you can always, you can still write a as uh, a lambda d of e lambda, where e is a resolution of the identity, which I will not define. But so it's a, the same ID, but. Uh, It's a spectral projection on the on the uh, eigenspaces. Okay, if you don't have seen that already, uh, it's fine. We will not use that. What what we will use uh, is uh, what we will call the spectral measure at a vector. <coughs> so if you take a vector. Okay, so there, if your operator is, is essentially self joint, there exists a unique measure such that uh, the moments of this measure. So I will denote it like that, mu g of psi uh, are equal to the scalar product of psi with respect to the power the, of the powers of a k for any k. Okay, so this measure, uh, let's see in examples what is it. So this measure, it's just uh, uh, if you believe to this formula, uh, you could put a k here and a k here. And uh, if, if you, you will find that mu g, this spectral measure, If you're familiar with the resolution of the identity, will simply be the, the, the projection of the vector psi on the vector on the on the vector space e i. Okay, so uh, in the finite case, uh, we have seen that. It will simply be the sum of the psi k scalar psi squared uh. okay, so in the finite case. Mu g psi is simply the sum of the psi k psi. Uh, Do we really need psi to decompete and support it? What? Do we really need psi to decompete and support it? Uh, no, we need that, but. If you call the domain of A uh, D of A, this would be true for any psi in D of A. For example, if your operator is bounded, it's true for any. When your operator is bounded, D of A is just L2 of V. So it would be for any. But I want to put under the carpet uh, on this uh, uh, issue with domains. Uh, so. Uh, for example, the, 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 the Cauchy still just transform, uh, maybe it should, I should have said that also. If, if psi is normalized, mu g of psi is a probability measure. Okay, 
So we will be interested by understanding this, this probability measure. Uh, another point is that from this definition, uh, if you apply it to psi, which is uh, which is uh, e of x, mm, the moments. <coughs> if you look at if you take psi, which is e of x, the moments of mu g of x are simply the number of closed walks of lengths k from x to x. Oh, right, it's closed. So. OK, so this measure encodes uh, closed walks in the graph starting at x. Um, the, the, uh, as I was saying, uh, the, so the moments are the powers of A, so the cauchy stilges transform. So if you look at, for example, the integral of lambda minus z takes z imaginary part of z. Uh, the Cauchy still just transform of this measure psi will simply be the you look at the, the, the resolvent of A estimated at z and you can take the scalar product against psi. Uh, OK. Uh, another comment, if when v is finite, OK, and uh, if you take the sum, so let's say cardinal of v is n, if you take the sum over all of the, if you take the spatial average of the spectral measure and the vectors, okay, so the spatial average of the spectral measure and the vectors against, uh, and spatial average with respect to the, the canonical basis, you apply uh, this formula. <coughs> so this is the sum. Okay, so you switch the two sums, and uh, since uh, the EK are an orthogonal, uh, EX form an orthogonal basis, and the psi K are, uni uh, are unit norm, what you arrive is simply the sum over all K of the delta lambda K, okay, which is the empirical distribution. Values. Right? Uh, which will we call also the average spectral measure. So, because it's, we obtain it as a spatial average of this uh, spectral measure of vectors. <coughs> and uh, in the physics community, it's sometimes called, it's usually called the, at least its limits as the graph size of the graph goes to infinity as the density of states. Okay, so uh, when you so this mu g of e x, if you look in a finite graph, it depends on the eigenvector basis and on the eigenvalues. But when you take a spatial average, a miracle occurs, a miracle, small miracle occurs, it does not depend on the eigenvector basis again. So this special average is much easier to understand than the spectral measure at vectors. So we will see that uh, uh, many times in this course. 
So, in particular, if you have a, a finite graph, we define mu of g as being uh, this object. spectral measure of the graph. So we've been interested by this measure when the size of the graph uh, is large and on random instance of graphs. Uh, you can make some computation. If you look at mu of a cycle of length n, OK? Uh, this will be, uh, you can make it, uh, this will be the sum of uh, 2 cos of 2 pi k over n. OK, so because the adjacency matrix, you will write it as uh, as s plus s star, where s is uh, permutation matrix of uh, the shift. OK, and S and S star, they commute, so it's uh, unitary matrices. OK, <coughs> you can check that. OK, you can make some simple computation like that on finite graphs. And uh, as n goes to infinity, these converge weakly to um, the arc sine distribution, uh, which is uh, 1 over pi. 1 over square root of 4 minus x squared indicator that x is smaller than 2 dx. OK. You can do the line, finite line, uh, exercise. And uh, it also converges to, as n goes to infinity, to if nu is an arc sine distribution to nu. OK, so now uh, what we want to do is we want to, to, to build, to construct this uh, spec. So we have, on finite graphs at least, we have, we have constructed an object, the so average spectral measure, which has a nice property to be, to depend only on the eigenvalues and not on the eigenvectors. We want to do the same on infinite graphs. So the first setting in which it's, it's uh, simple to do is on uh, transitive graphs. So I will do it for Cayley graphs. Uh, what should I write? Uh, I didn't use that. So on Cayley graph. Um, so what is it? Uh, you take uh, x a finitely generated group. OK. And you take s a symmetric set <coughs> of generators. So symmetric meaning that s minus 1 is S. I will use the multiplicative uh, notation for uh, group uh, operation. And uh, so now you can define uh, the Cayley graph of X associated to the set of generators S. So it's a graph. OK, so the vertex set is uh, the elements of the groups. And you put an edge. It's a set of edge. You take the set, such set. Uh, I have to see what, which convention I use. x, x minus 1 is in s. You take the set of, so take the set of pairs x, y, such that x, y minus s is in s. OK, so 
it's, uh, you take the set of pairs of the form x, uh, g, okay, g, x, where g is in its uh, symmetric set, and x is in Okay. So, for example, C n, uh, the cycle of length n is a Cayley graph of uh, z over n z with uh, the generator uh, plus n minus one. Then you can the, ob the uh, adjacency operator. So maybe I can make a picture. The adjacency operator, you can write it as a convolution operator. You can write it as a sum of the lambda g, where g is in the generating set, where lambda is uh, the left regular representation. So it's simply the representation. Sorry, I'm writing. Uh, so it's simply the multiplication operator, lambda g of uh, let's say E x is simply E of G x. Okay, so A is a convolution operator. And uh, the adjacency operator is uh, one of, uh, is an element of uh, a von Neumann algebra, which is a, an algebra of operators which is called the, uh, the group, uh, the left uh, group uh, von Neumann algebra, which are the, the algebra generated by, the, by this uh, lambda of g for all g. It's a comment. Uh, so the von Neumann algebra associated the group. It's also the algebra of, of uh, operators uh, on L2 of x, which are uh, invariant by the multiplication on the right, uh, okay, which commutes because uh, if you define the multiplication on the right, multiplication on the left and on the right, they commute. And uh, why do I mention that? Uh, uh, okay, and so it has been, and then the, you can define the, the, the what is called the Planchrel measure. So for we we are only interested by this adjacency operator, and the Planchrel measure is simply uh, the you look at the spectral measure at a vector, any vector. For example, if I denote by O the unit of uh, of x, because this uh, Cayley graphs they are transitive. So if you take g and you multiply it by x, it will be isomorphic to you have not changed the graph. If you multiply all entries, all, all vertices by x on the left, on the right, uh, you you know you have not changed the vertex set and you don't have changed so you do not have changed the edge set. So g is transitive. And uh, in particular, the number of closed walks does not depend on the on the point you take. And this is called the Planchrel measure. Among other name. 
And uh, if, your, if your graph is finite, uh, these two definitions coincide. Okay, um, so of course now you can make some, um, you can uh, make, there are three. Uh, you can uh, make some computations, so mu of, of z, uh, where is the addition? So it's simply uh, this arc sign law. Okay. Uh, is there? Uh, okay. Uh, you you can also, for example, if you look at mu of z d, uh, which is a tensor product, which is a sorry, is a Cartesian product of d copies of z, it will be the the convolution of d copies of the spectral measure of Z. Sean, if we are not familiar with the, the spectral theory of infinite graphs, then we could take as a definition of the spectral measure the, the, the guy with the number of walks and you know, say that there exists a measure with those moments. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. so if uh, you are not familiar... Could be taken as a definition or...? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, can, you could define, yeah, as I said, uh, let's open a parenthesis. So, so the, if the moment, if your graph, is the degrees in your graph, if the balls do not grow too fast, uh, there will be a unique measure <coughs> such that uh, the moments encode the number of closed walks. Uh, there will be a unique measure which will satisfy that and it can be your definition. Yeah. And for example, to check these formulas, for example, you could just look at the generating function of closed works on Z, on ZD, and uh, that's, w that's one way to prove them. Another way is to, to compute their Stilges transform. Okay. Which, uh, because the Stilges transform is just the generating function of the... But, but to prove that... Uh Say, assume that the degrees are bounded, the fact that there exists a measure whose moments are given by that, you need some spectral theory or you could do that by, by hand? No, no, you can do that by hand if you just check that. Uh, so the fact that this does not grow too fast, it is trivial. So you will have... The fact that there is always this... Always always there, yes, so there is some positivity that you have to prove, but uh, it's not that uh, tough. It will rely on the symmetry of the operator A. Um, Okay, so, so usual uh, group operation like Cartesian product or tensor product uh, will, uh, will, will have, you, you, can, you will be able to, if you have a tensor, if you have a Cartesian product between two Cayley graphs, between two graphs, the spectral measure will be the usual convolution operator of the two, uh, of the two uh, spectral measures. You can do uh, also other type of products, so for example, Kesten has computed the spectral measure of, of the tree of an infinite, uh, I think it was in 58, uh, of the infinite irregular tree, and so on. And uh, there is a nice explicit formula, uh, so it's called the Kesten measure, the Kesten Mackey measure. It's d times square root of 40 minus 1 minus x squared divided by 2 pi d squared minus x squared. Uh. So one way to prove that is to, uh, one way to prove that is to, 
just count doing the looking at the generating function of warps. Oh, yeah, so the stages transform. I recall you d mu g. So if you call that uh, uh, mk, okay, it depends on x, but it will not depend on x for. Uh, so it will be the sum of the minus at least for modulus of z large enough uh, minus okay so the stages transform is just uh, the generating function of the works and so you could compute the, the gen you can compute the generating function of closed works on uh, the infinite tree and you will find this computation that's what Kesten did the the tree is also the free product of uh, z over 2z of d copies. So this would be the free product okay. And uh, when you have free products of groups, the spectral measure it's not the usual convolution, but it's uh, it will be the free convolution of d copy of the it will be the free convolution of uh, the spectral measure of Z2. If you know what is a free convolution, uh, a mu of Z2 is simply uh, the... Uh, so this is a free convolution of D copies of uh, a Bernoulli variable. But if you don't know what is a free convolution, uh, it's fine. Ah, I, mean, I, I forgot something important. I have some lecture notes exactly on that, on my web page, where everything is uh, crystal clear, hopefully. Uh, you will find it on lecture notes, and then it's called spectral measure, spectrum of random graphs or something like that. Is it the, the 2D that we have seen in this case? Uh, uh, so the 2D regular tree would be the, 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 would be the free product of D copies of Z. But if you take z over 2z, it will be... Uh, okay, so you could write if d is even. This will be the... It's also the free product of... Uh, d copies. And for example, the arc sine law is uh, the free convolution of two copies, of the two, <coughs> two Bernoulli variables. Okay. Um, okay, so I will not go much more into explicit computation. Maybe at the end, uh, if I have time, I will do a fantastic computation. Uh, very nice, uh, because there are, there are uh, as I said, uh, there are examples where the, an important point is that the spectral measure depends very strongly on the set of generators. It's not something which only depends on the group. So it depends on the set of generators and on the group and on the group and on the set of generators. Uh, there are some examples of uh, so if I have time at the end I will do this computation. I will love to, but we will see. I will define the Lamplighter group uh, and uh, with uh, an exotic set of generators, uh, Grigor Schuk and Zuck. Uh, they prove that the spectral measure, the Planchel measure, the spectral measure of this group with an exotic set of uh, with an exotic set of generators uh, is purely atomic. Uh, Grigor Shukensug I found an example. of a purely atomic uh, spectral measure. Okay, well, I mean, on an infinite graph, obviously. And uh, if time, uh, and, and there is a very Lehner, uh, Neuerhauser, and thus, uh, 
they have given a very neat proof of uh, this uh, Grigor Shukzuk result. And uh, they have shown that lamplighter groups with this exotic set of generators, they are related to percolation graphs. Uh, I hope that I will have time to make the, exp the computation explicit, otherwise we'll do it in uh, exercise. Okay, uh, now uh, I want to continue and to define, I'm more interested by random instance of graphs. So I want to extend this notion of spectral measure, average spectral measure, to uh, graphs which have some stationarity, or which so what graphs which, which will be unimodular. So let's uh, start. Uh, so this was scaly graphs. What can I do to get that back? Ah, yeah. Okay, I will use the U. Okay, so, yeah, and with another set of generators on the lamplighter graph, with another set of generators, with the natural set of generators, you get a measure which is continuous. Uh, uh, so, what, so, unimodular graphs. So unimodular graphs, it will be another uh, setting. I mean, it will be kind of the, uh, the more general setup, which will include these scaly graphs and uh, these fine line graphs, in which we can make sense of an object, uh, the average spectral measure, which in some sense, it does not depend on the eigenvector basis. Okay? So what is it? So first, I have to define uh, quickly. So a rooted graph. Uh, what is that? It's a collection made by a G by connected graph plus uh, a distinguished vari a vertex, which we call the root. Okay. So I insist on connected graph. And then uh, you can define an equivalent, as a for usual graph, you can define an equivalence class uh, by uh, if there is a, a bijection between these two graphs which sends the vertex set from the one to another and which preserves, which sends the edges of the graph from one to another. You can define an equivalence class between rooted graphs by saying that two rooted graphs are equivalent if uh, <coughs> there exists a bijection from V to this vertex set of G to V prime, such that sigma of G is G prime. Okay, so the edges of, uh, of, of the, ver the graph E are sent to the edges of the graph E prime, and it's which sends the root of the graph uh, G to the root of the graph G prime. Okay, so <coughs> by that I mean that well, the sigma of an edge is uh, defined, is simply a sigma of X, sigma of Y. Okay? So when you have this notion of equivalence, you can def So this is an, an, an equivalence class. It's, uh, what, it's uh, what is called an unlabeled rooted graph. What you have lost is just uh, the name of the, the, the index of the vertices. Okay. And you can, since you have a, on rooted graphs, you have an origin, which is a root. So you can define a, a local topology. Right? So you can define the distance between two graphs, two rooted graphs, 
or equivalence class of rooted graphs, so unlabeled graphs. So I will be lousy and uh, and uh, make a systematic confusion between uh, a rooted graph and its uh, unlabeled version. So the distance between, so let's call G star uh, the set of uh, equivalence class. So if uh, G O and G prime O prime are in G star, you define a distance for it by just saying that they are, they are close if uh, around a large ball, uh, around the, their roots, they are, uh, uh, they are isomorphic. So the indicator, the sum, for example, you can take as distance 2 minus k indicator. That's a, so this is a notation for saying that this is a graph spanned by vertices at distance at least k, uh, no, at most k from the root. Okay, and by that I mean non-unitary. So this defines the distance on uh, G star. <coughs> so this defines a local topology. Uh, local because uh, it's defined on uh, it's, a, it's kind of uh, it's defined on uh, on uh, balls uh, finite size balls around the origin the root and uh, G star. With this distance is a uh, Polish space, so it's a, a, a complete separable metric space. So you you are in a good setup to diff to to study the probability measures on G star. And uh, with the distance, which will be the Levy distance, so the, the distance of uh, uh, consistent with a weak the weak topology associated to this distance t. Okay, so it will be again a polyspace. And so, and an element rho in p in this set in p of G star is a random rotated graph. Okay, so. Up to now, nothing uh, really happened. Then uh, Benjamini and Schramm in 2001, uh, they um, uh, uh, so this was this setup was proposed by them, but uh, the good the the, the, the So the, so the important idea is that when I have a graph, a finite graph G, I can associate an element in PG of star as follows. So you take G, a finite graph, and you define U of G as being, so we write it in two ways, it's the law of, you take O oh, uniformly, this, you take a uniformly distributed vertex on, you root it at a uniform point on the set of vertices of G and you look at the connected component G of X with the connected component of, of X in G and uh, so you look at that so in the world this is 1 over V sum over all X in phase of Dirac mass Okay, so you take what you do, you have a finite graph and you associate it with a, a probability measure which is obtained by routing, routing, routing it uniformly <coughs> at random. For example, so you have lose some information on the graph. Uh, you have lost some information on the graph. For example, if G is uh, uh, let's 
imagine that this is your graph. Okay? What will u of g will be? It's, it will be uh, 4 over 7 times the direct mass as that, plus uh, 3 over 7, no, uh, plus uh, 2 over 7 a direct mass at that rooted here, plus 1 over 7 a direct mass at this graph. Okay? So you have lost some information, you have lost the labels, but you also have lost some information on the connected components. Okay. So, uh, this measure U of G enjoys a very nice property. They are uh, unimodular. So you take a, a probability measure on um, on the wanted graph is unimodular. Uh, if, okay, so I've defined G star, so you can also define uh, G star star, which would be the, the uh, unlabeled, unlabeled doubly rotated graph. For any measurable form. F. So this will be the double, doubly rooted graphs, unlabeled doubly rooted graphs. Uh, so it's a, vert, it's a function which takes as, a, as entry a, a graph and two vertices, and which is invariant by, uh, which is invariant by, um, uh, by relabeling of the edge. That's another way to put it. So if for any function like that, so for example, we take it positive, you have uh, this equality. So I will write expectation of rho to say that I take the, the expectation of something, where the, uh, the expectation is taken with respect to this uh, measure rho. The sum over all vertices in my graph of f of g o x, so under rho g o, as a low rho, okay, is equal to the expectation of the same thing of f of g x o. So this notion of unimodularity is a, it's a mass transport principle. If you if you think about f of g of u v, some mass sent from u to v. It says that the amount of mass that the root send that the root sends to the rest of the graph of the of the vertices is equal to the amount of mass that the root receives. So it's a mass transport principle. And um, U of G is unimodular. Uh, for you take a finite graph, uh, U of G satisfies that. How can you realize G of X as uh, a equivalent class of uh, unity graph? How do I realize what? G of X as uh, an element in G star. So in this notation, so. G O is a is a random is a is a random wanted graph whose distribution is is a row, and now I sum. So G O is a well-defined object, so it has some vert the V is a vertex set of G, and I sum over all vertices of X of G of. So. F is defined on G star. F is defined on a G of star star, but since I have a variable. I can define, uh, since I have my, my random rooted graph, it has some vertices, so I can take uh, f of uh, g of uv. 
It's just that the pair formed by the vertex and the root has distribution rho. The pair formed by the graph and the root has distribution rho. Uh, yeah, the notation is a bit confusing. I cheat a little bit, but. Let's, let's see what this, if, if you have, uh, I claim that U of G is unimodular, let's take that. So what is this expression on the left hand side? Let's say by the cardinal of V. Well, there you go. So one of cardinal of V. This will be the sum. I take, I, I sample the root uniformly at random. So sum of, so this is my expectation with respect to rho, of f of g of y, y, x. Okay, so because when I sample the root, I, I take the root y, I, my graph g, I, uh, I recall you, but it's the law of g, o, o, where o is uniform at random. So it's g of y, y, x. This is what is on the left hand side. Well, g of y is a connected component of g, which contains y. Okay, so but g of y is equal to g of x if x and uh, g are connected. If a, if x in the, is in the connected component of g of y, so what is on the right hand side? Uh, Okay, so this is to be more precise. So you can rewrite it as the sum of that, of the sum of y belong to g of x, of f of g of x, okay? What's the expectation on the right-hand side? On the right-hand side? Ah, rho, rho. Sorry. And so this expression is exactly uh, the expression of rho of the sum over all y of f of g uh, x uh, g y o. Okay. So in fact, that's the only example of unimodular measure we know. <laughs> Why do I say that? Why do I say that? Uh, uh, you define the set of U of G, G finite. And you close it for this uh, local weak topology. And this is a set of uh, sophic measures. So it's a definition. Let's say rho is sophic if rho belongs to a measure of random rooted graphs is sophic if, it, if it's uh, a weak local weak limit of uh, finite graphs. Okay, so uh, unimodular, the set of unimodular graphs is closed, so it's, uh, it's contained in the set of uh, unimodular measures. But uh, we don't know an example of a unimodular measure which is not sophic. So that's what I said, this is the only example of unimodular graphs we know. Uh, for example, um, so you can, and, and if UG, another definition, if G is finite, GN is finite, is a sequence of finite graphs, we will say that GN has Benjamin Ishram limit rho if um, U of GN converge for in this uh, topology, in this local weak topology, 
uh, to uh, rho. Okay? So BS is for Benjamin Ishram. And rho will be, uh, by definition, it's a sophic measure. But Okay. Some examples uh, quickly. Of Benjamin Schramm limits. So if you take uh, CN, if you take uh, Okay, so Cn has Benjamin Ishram limit, uh, a Dirac mass at Z <coughs> centered at zero H. Okay, so you take the root uniformly at random. And around, as n grows large, we not see the cycle, so we just see Z. Uh, so if you take uh, Zd, and you intersect it with a finite box, uh, this will have Benjamin Ishram limit. A Dirac mass at uh, Zd, center at zero G. If you do the per, for example, if you do site percolation, so you, you keep each uh, site uh, or let's say bond percolation. You keep it edge with probability p. And this will have Benjamin Ishram limit. So it's random, so it's almost surely. This random graph will have Benjamin Ishram limit. The law of, uh, uh, of, you look at the percolation graph in Zd with parameter p. You root it at the origin, you look at the connecting component which connect contains the origin, and that's that. Uh, if you take a, a dirigular tree, uh, if you take, a, for example, a binary tree of depth uh, n, mu of uh, Tn, sorry, will have Benjamin Ishram limit. Which uh, it and let's say uh, you take a a, a, a a three regular tree cut at depth n, the Benjamin Ishram of T n uh, will not be uh, the infinite regular graph because with because when you sample a, a, a vertex uniformly at random, <coughs> you are quite likely to be close to the edge as a Benjamin Ishram limit, which is something which is called the canopy graph. I think the word comes from Eisenman and, <coughs> and Varzel. It's 2L? Where is she? It's 2L? 1L? Which is a random tree that I invite you to describe. Uh, in fact, many random graphs have, have uh, trees, have infinite trees as uh, limits. Uh, for example, so uh, let's just say that there is one family of random graphs, of random infinite graphs. So, an Erdos-Schrenny graph, so maybe I finish like that. An Erdos-Schrenny graph. With n vertices and c over n, where you put it, you have n vertices and you put an edge uniformly, you put an edge independently for BTC over n. It will have almost sure limit, a Benjamin Ishram limit, which will be a Galton Watson tree uh, with Poisson offspring distribution. A Galton Watson tree with Poisson offspring distribution. Which, by the way, it implies that this tree, if this random tree, is uh, unimodular. It's a nice exercise to check directly that this tree is unimodular. And uh, okay, and so on. 
In fact, all graphs, all sequence of finite graphs have, uh, nearly all sequence of finite graphs have Benjamin Nishram limits. For example, uh, I can just say that. Uh, Gn, the sequence Gn is pre compact if for some function f uh, such that uh, f of x over x goes to plus infinity uh, for the sum, the average. If you look at the degrees of x, so as soon as the degree sequence is uniformly integrable, uh, your sequence is pre-compact for this benjamin nishram limit. So all families of graphs that you will come up with, which have degrees which are not too wide, they have some uh, benjamin nishram limit, or subsequential limits. OK. So maybe now I come back to spectrum. Yes. No. It's a it's a it's a it's a lemma. So pre-compact meaning uh, it's closure, it's compact. Okay. So and uh, a, a sufficient criterion for being pre-compact for a sequence of finite graphs to be pre-compact in sense of the benjamin Nishram topology <laughs> is to have these degrees uniformly bounded. Pre-compact means its closure is compact. OK? Did I lost you? Yes, it's OK. What? It's OK? Or? Yes. Okay. Sorry, but is it for any fast-growing function, or...? If, if you take your favorite function which satisfies that, if there exists a fun I mean, if your graph will be pre-compact, if there exists a function f, oh. which goes to infinity faster than x, such that... Okay. So, uh, in other words, uh, your sequence will be pre-compact if the degree sequence is uniformly integrable. But I This is uh, la vallée poussin criterion of uh, uniform integrability. OK, so back to spectrum. Uh, back to spectrum. Ah, I forgot to say something. Uh, OK, too bad. Uh, back to spectrum. <laughs> Uh, there is, uh, I speak about, they have uh, this spectral measure, so you define if rho is a uh, unimodul, if rho is in uh, p uh, g star, you define mu of rho as being the expectation of mu g Okay, so this is if rho and rho almost surely the adjacency operator of G is essentially self adjoint. Then this object exists, and I can take an average and I define it as a spectral measure of rho. Okay, so there are two claims. There is a theorem of Nelson from 74, which says that I mean, it's a consequence of the theorem of Nelson on 74, which is a consequence that uh, if rho is unimodular, uh, A, rho almost surely, A is essentially self adjoint. So when you have, a, when you have a, a unimodular measure, uh, when you have a unimodular uh, measure, 
you, your, 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 uh, your adjacency operator is always up, up to uh, taking a closure, is always self-adjoint. So this, in particular, mu rho always exists. And the reason behind that, this theorem, so Nelson is about, is a theorem, but because when you have a unimodular measure, you can associate, uh, I mentioned this, this group for Neumann algebra. Uh, there is an analog of this group for Neumann algebra, but you can associate with any unimodular measure. But uh, I will not say more about that, I don't have enough time. So it means, at least it's a very neat statement, so it means that you are in a very, it's a, it's, it's a good framework. And uh, this definition contains uh, all previous definitions. So if, if G is finite, uh, mu of U of G, this is my simply my spatial average formula. This is mu of G. Okay. And uh, if G is uh, a Cayley, a Cayley graph, uh, a Dirac mass at G routine that is unimodular, uh, okay, and uh, mu of g, and again mu of rho, mu of direct mass at is mu of g. Okay, so the another theorem, uh, it's uh, you def it's that if g n as Benjamin Ishram, so it's a sequence of finite graph, as Benjamin Ishram rho, then mu, uh, the, the Kolmogorov-Smirnov of distance between mu of gn and uh, mu of rho goes to zero, where the Kolmogorov-Smirnov of distance between two measures is a supremum, of, is an infinity norm of the partition function. So this Kolmogorov-Smirnov distance convergence implies the convergence of atoms. So this theorem probably it's uh, uh, we can credit it to probably to Abert. And at least for the atomic part, uh, we will see. Uh, the corollary of that is that if rho, it's a, this is Tom, if rho is unimodular, uh, is sophic, and mu of rho of lambda is positive, then Lambda is uh, an algebraic integer because atoms of finite graphs, there are the zeros of the characteristic polynomial, which is an inte integer valued, uh, uh, it's a monic integer valued uh, polynomial. So the atoms, the eigenvalues of a finite graph, has to be uh, uh, algebraic integer. So it's, it's even a totally real. Algebraic integer, totally real, means that all uh, Galois conjugates of, the, of lambda are also algebraic integer. Uh, algebraic. So if you find a unimodular graph which has an atom at a point which is not an algebraic integer, you will have proven that uh, there are non sophic unimodular graph and you will be famous. Another corollary is that if for all n large enough, uh, g n has at least delta n distinct eigenvalues. Then 
uh, the and the GNS Benjamin Schramro, then mu of rho, it's continuous, if you look at the total mass of its continuous part, is at least delta. And again, it's an exercise, but it's bas based on the fact that when you converge in Kolmogorov's distance sense, you converge, the atoms converge. So let's uh, prove this uh, theorem. So we will find a full proof in my notes. So if the statement would have been the, dist the, 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 the but mu of Gn converge weakly to mu of rho, it, was, it would be very easy. So let's assume for simplicity that the degrees are bounded. Are bounded uniformly. Then the moments is simply the number of closed works by the Nicolas definition. Number of closed works from the root to the root of length k. This is some function of, of g. It only depends on the graph. Uh, at finite depths, at the, at the, at the graph spanned by vertices at distance at least at most k from the. So it's a, some function of this of this local neighborhood, and it's bounded because my graph it's bounded by theta power k because I have assumed by my that my degrees are bounded. So you have a bounded continuous function. So it implies that the. Mm, so it imply it will imply that. Uh, this converge, it will imply that the expectation of that which is the case moment of d mu rho uh, converge, uh, d mu of gn, sorry, uh, will converge to uh, mu rho uh, weekly, uh, so will converge to the case moment. because it's bounded function. OK? So this implies a weak convergence. So what is the subtle here? It's a convergence of in a for a stronger distance, which is this kolmogorov smirnov If you want to check that mu n, you have a real probability measure on R. <coughs> and you want to check that mu n converge in this Kolmogorov uh, of sense to zero, it's equivalent to checking to that for any lambda, the atoms converge. Uh, mu n. And uh, that uh, mu g n converges weakly to mu. Okay, so the weak convergence, we already did it. It's just that, because the convergence of moments implies a convergence, at least for bounded, uniformly bounded graphs. And uh, we, we have to check the convergence of atoms. And there is this, so from the portmanteau theorem, the lim sup of mu of gn of lambda, of lambda so when I write mu g of lambda, I should be I should write that. Okay, the limb soup of mu g n of lambda is bounded by mu rho of lambda. Okay, and the limb of mu g n of uh, lambda minus epsilon lambda plus epsilon. It's at least mu rho of lambda minus epsilon lambda plus epsilon, which is larger than mu rho of lambda. So the statement that the atoms converge 
is implied in this lemma, which is due to Luc, which says the following, that for any lambda and uh, theta, there, exi there exists a continuous function delta, so which depends on lambda and theta, such that delta of 0 is 0. And for any finite graph, for any finite graph, G with uh, degrees in G bounded by theta, uh, mu, you can bound the mass of the interval of size epsilon around lambda by the mass of the atom at lambda plus delta of epsilon. So if you buy this lemma, uh, you will get precisely uh, the convergence of atoms. Because you will say that mu g of lim lambda minus epsilon not of a slope is bounded by mu g of lambda plus delta epsilon, so you have the inequality in the other sense. So this is a beautiful lemma. And uh, so for general lambda, Abert uh, found a proof. I will do the proof for lambda equal to zero and found the delta at uh, one line. Excuse me, the base from the degree is uniformly bounded for all graphs or for each? At the beginning, yeah, it's just to avoid, I mean, if your degrees are not uniformly bounded and you want to prove this theorem, you first have to do some uh, truncation of the degrees of the graph and say that uh, the spectral measure does not change too much if you bound the degree, so it's, you have to use some uh, deviation inequalities of eigenvalues, but okay, I, I, I just, let's forget about that. In the notes, it's written. So when lambda is equal to zero, uh, what do you do? You say, you observe, so G is my finite graph. You take lambda one up to lambda n, let's say that G again, it's again values. And then the observation is that the product of the lambda i lambda i non-zero is an integer. Uh, why is it true? For various reasons. One of which is that it is uh, one of this expression up to the sign is, e is equal to a derivative of the poly characteristic polynomial at zero. Okay, so the case derivative at zero will be the sum over all subsets i of cardinal k of the product of the lambda i not in i of the lambda i. And there will be probably a minus one power k, or n minus k, uh, minus one power k. Okay, so you take k as being the dimension of the uh, image of A, and you will get that. So in particular, uh, its absolute value, since it cannot be zero, it's at least one. So 
So it means that the eigenvalues, they, 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 they repel. So if they are not zero, they cannot be arbitrarily close to zero. And but you can also bound it by uh, if, let's say, k is a number of eigenvalues in lambda in uh, minus epsilon epsilon. So k is equal to n times mu g of minus epsilon epsilon. Okay. Uh, this is bounded by either you are at most epsilon and then you are bounded by epsilon, or you are less or you are not in this interval. But then you use the fact that the degrees are bounded, and the operator norm of the graph is bounded by the, uh, the maximal degree. So you, it's bounded by theta power n minus k. OK, so you just need that. And then so you take the log of that. And uh, so 0 k log epsilon. So you can take delta of epsilon, which would be uh, log theta divided by log of 1 over epsilon. So this is for lambda equal to 0. In more general lambdas, uh, you can see in the notes, but uh, it's the same idea. But uh, the fact that you are not exactly equal to a given value uh, gives you some uh, repulsion. Due to, but the fact that uh, uh, you have uh, the, the adjacency operator is integer valued. Ah, OK, I'm already late. So um, OK, so I will not do the computation on the lamp lighter. And, um, uh, yes, so maybe I will stop here. Thank you.